So I'm going to talk about Twitter today and how, you, how we could potentially use Twitter to develop your academic career. And this talk could be about social media in general, but I am going to sp speak specifically to my experiences with Twitter for the next 15 or so minutes and what I've learned over the last few years of using it, engaging it, and engaging it more and more in a professional sense, um, and what I've learned from watching others use it for their professional development. <clears throat> so I have nothing to disclose. I'm not paid by Twitter. Um, so one of the most important things for me as I've been engaging with social media in different, in, in a professional way is to really reflect on not, and to tell people not just who I am, but how that informs my work. So for you, for you guys, because I will use a lot of personal experiences, I'm a bilingual, bicultural Colombian immigrant Latina. I'm a neonatologist, as I mentioned, and a health equity scientist, but I'm also a wife and a mother. Um, and all of that informs the identity that I hold really dear, which is a, as a child health advocate. And importantly, all, all of these hats, all of these identities do come through really purposefully in my Twitter account, um, but are helping me to develop not just the research portfolio and the advocacy portfolio that I'm trying to develop um, professionally, but then how I engage Twitter to help me develop that um, that identity on online. So who I am deeply informs and iteratively, iteratively informs why and how I engage on Twitter. And I think that's something to think about is if you're using social media, as you're, using, as you're deciding how to use it, wh whether to use it and how to use it, is to think about who you are and what your identity is within academia and within your professional roles and how Twitter can help advance that. So what is Twitter and what is Twitter not? Um, that's where I like to start this talk. So as I'm sure most people know, it's a highly um, flexible, publicly available social media platform with a large source of information. And importantly to this talk, ready-made networks, which is really what I've been able to tap into professionally. Um, and I find it especially useful as a way for scientists and doctors to reach non-academic and non-medical audiences. And what I've been most surprised with um, in, a, in a really is basically connections between strangers or between people that may not cross paths in, in kind of physical, the physical space and the physical continuum. And that can really be used to our advantage um, as we develop not just professional relationships, but an identity for which to be recognized. What it is not, which is really important to say from the beginning, is it's not a protected safe space. It's not a space where one doesn't have to consider professionalism, and it's not an immediate access to a large audience. And this is a point to make if you're using Twitter for dissemination or for identity development um, as a voice or a platform, is that it starts like most other social media circles as an echo chamber of people who you know and who you follow. And it does take work to extend beyond that echo chamber. It's also not a replacement for direct communication or outreach. It's absolutely not free from misinformation, as anyone who's engaged in it can attest. It's not always a quick tool to use in an academic or professional sense, and it's not always a good use of your time. So I'm just wanting to, as we start to dive into this, um, acknowledge the fact that this is just a tool that doesn't need to be um, the primary um, um, vacuum of your time and that's something to be to be cognizant of and protect yourself from but it is all about connection um, and so there's a great potential role for twitter that i have found in that other and i have seen others use twitter for for personal education but also education of others and the audience can vary for professional development which i'll talk about and definitely for networking community building and as I mentioned to you guys, being a child health advocate is an important part of who I'm trying to be as a professional and as an individual, and Twitter definitely has a role in terms of advocacy, public health, social justice, and improved physician-patient communication. Nothing has shown us more, more better than the last two years how important it is to invest in that trust between physicians and patients and medical community and academic communities and society as a pandemic and the... Um, parallel pandemic of misinformation and distrust in science and medicine that COVID-19 uncovered. And so I think this Twitter has an incredible role for helping us really break some of the walls that may exist between us and patients or the lay media. <clears throat> so one of the ways in which um, I believe that Twitter can be really useful for science and academic and, and I use science because my focus is a lot on my scientific research, but really your academic suits, is that it allows for you to real-time share your expertise and what you're trying to build your identity around. So you can share ideas, but, I, 
but you can also share physiologic principles. So there are people who develop identities on Twitter as educators and who are breaking down physiologic principles that previously existed in small classroom settings or large lecture settings, but within institutions publicly in a way to develop themselves as an educator, if that's their academic track. It's a way to share and tell others about your funded grants or new projects that you want to build understanding of or engagement with. Definitely a way to talk about new published studies, and I hope to show you an example of that. Um, a way to promote yourself or others about their upcoming or recent talks. If I wasn't on service, I might have tweeted about this talk today, but it's, it's been a busy week. Um, or any promotions. And so the this is one of the this is one of the ways in which it can I think is particularly useful to a, to a group like this and conversation like this because traditionally one of the ways in which gender inequities have occurred in academia and science is a difference in the ways in which women get promoted in terms of um, not necessarily promoted academically or professionally through a calendar but how people promote their name or their identity or their expertise and this is really democratizing that ability to promote ourselves and sponsor ourselves in, in a larger audience. Oops. Okay. Um, so for instance, this is a tweet um, that I um, wrote when I had a chance to talk with, to talk on a panel during, um, in our, like about a year ago during the pandemic, where I had an opportunity to serve on a panel with some of our state representatives, trying to combat some of the COVID misinformation and um, my, um, shop advocacy and PR team was involved and knew that I was participating in this panel. And not only did they then talk about uh, me participating in this panel, but then I was able to amplify that experience. And, you know, in this way, helping to um, promote the side of my academic persona, which was as a public health advocate, particularly during a pandemic. Um, and I did, you know, do a lot of work during the pandemic in terms of COVID um, information and misinformation, particularly among um, communities that um, historically were have been mistreated and marginalized and for which therefore distrust existed. And this helped sort of to build that um, knowledge institutionally as someone that people could refer to me for those kinds of talks. Um, this is an example of a, a tweet of a grant. Um, so Dr. Heather Burris and Dr. Gina South are two scientists here at Penn and CHOP that I deeply admire the work that they are doing. They have beautiful science and they um, recently had an R01 funded on just amazing, gorgeous science um, in our community. Um, and so you can see the ways in which they are not just talking about their R01 and what they aim to study, but then also connecting to their to their collaborators in a public way, um, to the ident to the institutions that um, in which they live. So you can see like the pen, different pen institutions that are linked to this tweet. So this is an example of how you use a tweet for um, announcing a new grant, building some an, building some engagement and potential excitement around some work that will be coming. Um, but then also building networks between these institutions and the individual investigators themselves. What then ends up happening oftentimes in, in institutions that have their own um, staff dedicated to their own Twitter accounts is that these tweets might then be retweeted and amplified and the connections and the audience can grow in that way. <clears throat> and then this is, this is an example of a published paper and someone um, tweeting about that. And what I really love about this is that this is a way for us to really, again, democratize the knowledge that we are, if you are involved in research or QI or project development, to democratize the findings and the knowledge that we are, that we are generating within our um, academic institutions. Um, so it does take a little extra work after your paper is published to create what's called either a tweet or a Twitter thread about your paper, but you're really condensing and distilling the main findings of your paper, maybe exciting methodologies or exciting data set uses into tweets for people to understand, oh, this is what this researcher is about, or maybe this is a researcher who has expertise in this. This can lead to then potential media attention for science that sometimes doesn't you know, there's some amazing science being done that doesn't always get the lay media attention it deserves. This is a way to start to get at some of that as well. But it shows you a way to um, get some of the knowledge that exists often between behind paywalls um, into the general lay um, uh, conversation in a way that is controlled by the investigator themselves. Um, and then this is the same idea. So then the other thing to think about as you're 
engaging in Twitter for with academic messages or professional messages is who your audience is. And this gets at that idea that you don't immediately get a large audience. And most of the time people are um, preaching to the choir, their echo chamber or in reach, which can still form some, can still have some benefit for your academic portfolio because you might be um, tweeting among people who might be reading your papers or reading grants and really recognizing you as an expert in this field and becoming excited about your work and your expertise. There's some research, here's the paper that I cited, about how many followers you have to have before your Twitter account really starts to have more outreach effect or where you're really more singing from the rooftops versus preaching to a choir. The number seems to, to, seems to linger around 2,000 followers where sometimes your tweets will start to get retweeted by people not within your immediate networks. And then you can start to have some impact as an academic professional outside of that echo chamber, maybe to the media, the public, or other decision makers. I have found Twitter to be very useful for my own professional development and education. There's um, some accounts that I follow to just learn about new papers that I need to know in my field. So for instance, Evidence-Based Neo really likes to distill papers into these tweets, imaged tweets. And this is how I learn about papers that maybe my colleagues are gonna be talking about or that I should look at and maybe change my clinical practice about. Um, it's a way to learn about conference content without attending the conference. More and more people are t live tweeting conference information. And so even if you couldn't get to all the conferences, especially as the world opens up and we're all traveling again, um, you can still get some of the knowledge you might've picked up at a conference from following people who are live tweeting it. Or conversely become the source of conference content, which is again, a way to develop yourself as an expert. And it's definitely a way to have <clears throat> real time debates and, and conversations with others in your field or crowdsource some expertise or knowledge that you might need. So here is a tweet that I, I had where I was asking people about their experiences with REDCap and what, um, how I should potentially design a, a survey and got some really interesting um, responses that changed how I designed my survey. Importantly for academic promotion, we know that we need to document impact of our papers or how many times we're cited or things like that. But I think as we move into this digital age more and more within and, and recognize that we are in this digital age more and more within academia, we're starting to that maybe this impact will be included on dossiers and portfolios for promotion. And Twitter does give you some impact, some, some metrics about the impact of messaging with impressions or engagement rates, engagement rates or follows or how many people are clicking on your profile. So how many people are learning about you as the expert you have um, created yourself to be. And then finally, um, finding collaborators, building your research team and building community can be a really important part of Twitter. And that is so important for any of us who have an identity that makes us maybe underrepresented in an area or um, just one of, one of a few. So for instance, you can see on the right here, there is there was a tweet about people wanting to connect if they were they identified as a Latina and they were interested in emergency medicine to just connect online to learn about each other. I found my first clinical research coordinator on Twitter by posting my job, my job posting on Twitter. Um, and I, I cannot do my science without her. And I moved her here from Texas. And the only way that she applied is because she saw the job posting that was retweeted on Twitter. So it can have very concrete impact on your day-to-day um, -day function as a scientist. I have more to share, but I think I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop there and allow time for questions.